Good evening, folks. Watching people log in. We've got a lot of people registered tonight, so we're going to give folks a couple minutes to get logged in. For those of you that are already with us, if you wouldn't mind jotting a note in the questions box, which you'll find in the tab in your GoToWebinar panel on the right of your screen, just to let me know that the audio is working. That would be awesome. Excellent. Great, thank you. That is always good to know. I'm gonna give folks maybe a minute or two past seven um, to get logged in and then we'll get started because we want to be mindful of your time. We've got over 370 people registered for tonight. That's exciting for us. That's one of our large events. So for those of you just joining us, um, we're giving everybody just maybe another minute to get logged in. And then we're gonna get started. Looks like the traffic of people entering is slowing down just a little bit. So we will go ahead and get started. Thanks for joining us tonight, connecting with the Pennsylvania Game Commission. My name is Lori, and I'm gonna be managing this session. Um, seems like audio is working okay. Everybody that was on early was able to jot me a note in the questions tab, which folks can find at the right of their screen in that GoToWebinar panel. Uh, we're going to use that maybe later for questions. We're shooting to keep this session tonight just over an hour in length. We expect the formal part of the presentation to last about 40 minutes, and then we're going to open it to questions, which you can use that question tab for. Um, don't panic if we don't get to your question. We've got a lot of people registered tonight and we know we may not get to all the questions. So we are already planning to summarize questions with answers in an email that everybody who registered will get after the rep, after the webinar. You'll get um, a summary of the questions, additional resources, links to any videos we might talk about throughout the evening tonight. Um, let's see. We, we are recording the session tonight. So in a separate email, it will, it will actually come. So you'll get two emails. That separate email will be a link to the recording. So you'll be able to follow it up later. If you have to check out earlier, if you had to join us late, you'll be able to get a link to the full recording at a later date. So I think that takes care of all the housekeeping. Um, Tonight we have with us some of the very um, talented folks from the Game Commission. I'm going to introduce the first and then we will carry it from there. Um, so first we have with us tonight, Seth Masoris. He is a supervisor in the Southwest region. He is a game warden. Seth, I am going to turn it over to you to um, say anything you would like to say about your role at the agency and then we'll uh, move on to the next person. Yes, thank you, Lori. Um, yes, as she said, my name is Seth Masaurus. I am a state game warden. I'm the current information and education supervisor 
in the Southwest region. Uh, I reside in Cambria County. I've been on the job for about 15 years uh, and I've been hunting for approximately 30 years. And, and pheasants is one of those things that I thoroughly enjoyed hunting uh, when I was younger. I don't have as much time now, but I still try and get out when I do have the time. And um, hopefully everyone will get a lot out of this presentation tonight. Thanks, Seth. Next up, we have uh, Steve Smith. He is the director of the Bureau of Information and Education. All right. Thank you, Lori. As Lori said, my name is Steve Smith. Uh, first, I just wanted to say uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, this webinar is part of our new uh, program. We're calling it Learn to Hunt, and we've rolled it out this year. The goal is just to provide uh, the hunters with the tools that you need to be successful this fall. So we started it several weeks back with a Squirrel Hunting 101 presentation. And if you weren't able to view that uh, in real time, uh, a recording of it is available on our YouTube channel as well. So if you go to the Game Commission website, uh, scroll down to the bottom and look for the YouTube icon. And then from YouTube, look for recent videos from the Game Commission and the presentation is there. And as well, there's another video on uh, looking for sign when hunting squirrels. But tonight we're gonna change species and, and talk about pheasant hunting. And for me, this is something that I just started pheasant hunting about four years ago. And I had been hunting for, for about 25 years up until then. And I quickly realized even with 25 years of experience that I had a lot to learn when it came to hunting pheasants. And there was a lot of trial and error on my part. So as we look to expand this program and how we can provide resources to hunters, uh, because of that, pheasant hunting quickly jumped uh, to the top of our list. And not only is it challenging, but at the same time, in my opinion, it's probably the most exciting form of hunting that we have here in Pennsylvania. And we are fortunate uh, here at the Game Commission to have an in-house experts of sorts when it comes to hunting pheasants. He probably wouldn't call himself that. He's too humble, but I've seen him and he is an expert. So that is Derek Stoner, and he's going to be leading tonight's presentation and sharing his expertise with all of us. So I'll turn it over to you now, Derek. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. Uh, thank you, Seth, and thank you, Laurie. Uh, we're so excited to have everyone here uh, on the call this evening, and we're really looking forward to sharing with you as much as we can about pheasant hunting. It's, as Steve just said, it's very exciting. Uh, it's a, a wonderful way to spend time outdoors in the fall season with friends and family. Um, my background as far as hunting is that I started hunting here in Pennsylvania uh, 32 years ago. It's hard to believe it's been that long. I started uh, when I was 12, and it's been a wonderful, uh, long, long uh, career, and I look forward to many more years of field. But uh, similar to Steve, I, I did not start out pheasant hunting. I've only been pheasant hunting for the past uh, 13 or 14 years, and in that time, I've become deeply passionate about uh, pursuing pheasants. I actually started out with my first ever pheasant hunt in the the wilds of North Dakota. I did not start in Pennsylvania, but uh, I quickly, once I returned to Pennsylvania, I quickly caught on that we have wonderful pheasant hunting here. Uh, we have an incredible resource uh, the Pennsylvania Game Commission provides in uh, stocked pheasants uh, statewide. We're gonna talk about that with you. Um, but my background is that I, I have a, uh, a chocolate lab and we like to go pheasant hunting as much as possible uh, during the season and we will share with you during this presentation a lot about the excitement of hunting with uh, dogs and without dogs. And so we want to just give you a really strong background on how to prepare for the upcoming pheasant season, uh, whether you choose to go afield by yourself, with a dog, with friends, with family, whatever it may be, we're here to help you. Uh, like Steve said, our team is, is looking forward to answering your questions. Uh, here's photos of us, and we are going to uh, spend plenty of time at the end of this presentation this evening uh, going through those questions that you've asked. So let's get started. Uh, the ringneck pheasant was introduced to the U.S. from Asia in the early 1900s, so a little over 120 years or so ago. Ringneck pheasants were brought into the western United States, and then it was found that they adapted so well to the habitat here, particularly agricultural lands, that um, many states started to stock them in their uh, fields and provide opportunities for hunters. Pheasants really are a quintessential member of the chicken family, so they're in that game bird family that chickens come from, and they make a, a rather large, a rather loud chicken-like squawk. And when we send you the PDF, you'll be able to click on that link and listen to those sounds. Pheasants are 
well known for eating a really wide variety of seeds, grains, and insects, and they're really excellent. Even though brightly colored, uh, the males are, even though they're, they're really an iridescent color, they're able to hide really well in thick vegetative cover. So when you get this uh, link, you're going to be able to click on the uh, what we call the wildlife note and learn more about pheasants um, here in Pennsylvania, learn about their biology, their habitat. They're really fascinating game birds, um, a lot of interesting um, things to be learned about them through clicking on that wildlife note. This shows us the classic look of a male pheasant in flight and a female pheasant in flight. So like we said, the male is really brightly colored. They're called a ring-necked pheasant because they have a bright white collar or ring around their neck. And then the rest of their body is really a tapestry of color, everything from a purplish blue sheen on their head um, to a greenish iridescence around their throat. Uh, they have reddish wattles, which are uh, fleshy parts on their face. And then the rest of their body, their wings and back and belly is a mix of oranges and reds and white and even gold and yellow and black and brown. So it's really um, amazing how that bird has evolved to have such incredible coloration. And then for contrast, the female pheasant is really simply a blend of browns and black and white and tan. So she has incredible camouflage as a game bird. They spend most of their time on the ground and the female pheasant is going to be laying her nest uh, or making her nest and laying her eggs on the ground. And in that uh, manner, she needs to be incredibly well hidden from the eyes of predators. And so that's the reason for the female pheasant's coloration. Pheasants are primarily a ground-based bird, so most game birds in this family, pheasants, quail, chuckers, partridges, etc., most of them spend probably 99% of their time walking on the ground. Occasionally when danger is near, they'll take flight, but they prefer to run generally and hide. Only as a last resort are they going to take off and fly. So this uh, rooster or male pheasant here strutting through the grass is really kind of showing the, you that classic look of a pheasant on the move. Um, his, his bright white ring neck is showing quite readily, and this is something that you're not likely to see while hunting them. They're typically going to be hidden until the last moment when they explode from cover and fly up into the air. Pheasants do, however, spend a little bit of time in trees. They will uh, take cover in trees if flush. They know instinctively that if a predator is on the ground, such as a, a fox or coyote, that uh, sitting in a tree is going to be much safer for them. And so occasionally you'll see a pheasant in a tree, particularly uh, right after birds have been stocked. Some of them might be a little um, spooked and might land in a tree, but eventually they'll make their way down to the ground and spend time there. I want to point out one thing on this uh, photo you can see rather readily. The, the rear of the pheasant's leg has a spur on it. The males have spurs that are used for fighting, just as uh, chickens and, and, of course, wild turkeys are well known for those spurs. So they do, during mating season, which is the spring, they do battle it out and they will use those spurs to um, try to hurt uh, the other male pheasant that they're battling. And so that's something to kind of take note of when you harvest a male pheasant in the field, is that they will have these little sharp spurs on the rear of their leg. Pennsylvania Game Commission stocks over 200,000 pheasants each fall, and these are raised on two different game farms in the state, and this provides an incredible uh, resource to hunters, and they are stocked throughout the season. Uh, the preseason stockings will be the week before the season starts. This year, our regular season for pheasants starts on October 23rd. The youth season actually starts this Saturday, October 9th, and so stocking is going to be taking place tomorrow statewide for youth season. So this simply shows the method in which the pheasants are stocked. They're transported in wooden crates that have um, slats for uh, viewing and, and uh, the birds are able to, to breathe fine and transport and then they're released. And these birds have been uh, propagated in places that allow them to grow strong and be very, very incredibly capable flyers. And so much to the dismay of many folks, they're not going to be acting like chickens out there, they immediately take well to the wilds and provide incredible sport for hunters afield. Pheasants are absolutely creatures of farmland, and this is really where Pennsylvania comes on strong and offering great pheasant habitat. We 
We no longer have uh, truly wild pheasant populations due to a variety of reasons um, changing in of farming practices and, and heightened predator populations among them. However, the pheasant is really, really still at home in our state because of the great agricultural uh, landscape. And so wherever sto uh, stockings take place, it typically is in habitat that looks like this. So it might be a mix of crops and some different types of weeds like foxtails and other grasses, and then might be adjoining hedgerow habitat. And occasionally, wetlands, pheasants are known to get into cattail wetlands especially, but when you boil down to the very essence of pheasant hunting and what they uh, prefer to be living in, it's farm fields. And so the linear nature of farm fields really makes for efficient hunting. So the rectangular blocks of cover are much uh, more readily covered by hunters who are organized and prepared. So if we go out pheasant hunting, and we look at a giant field and we try to figure out how to hunt it, most of the time hunters decide to kind of make it into blocks and say, well, let's cover this block of the field and then we'll turn around and cover the next block. And in that manner, you're able to cover it very efficiently. And ideally, you're going to be able to uh, detect and flush as many pheasants as possible because they're out there and usually they're very hidden. And that's the challenge of pheasant hunting is to get the bird to leave the ground, to fly up into the air, and then to take a shot, which is usually pretty challenging, uh, with your shotgun and connect on that shot and bring the pheasant down within range. And typically when we talk about uh, a reasonable shooting range for pheasants, we might say 30 yards or less. So you have to be pretty quick because it doesn't take very long for the pheasant to get well beyond 30 yards and keep going and fly uh, quite, a, quite a distance. And so this is an important thing to consider as you had a field is that you want to get the birds to flush within range and ideally in croplands they're going to hold rather tight in this type of cover illustrated in the photo. When you look at the season um, for pheasants, the early part of the season, pheasants are going to spend a lot of time in the edges of fields and in fields that haven't been harvested. But once you get to the latter part of the season, there's not going to be as much uh, field cover available. A lot has been harvested. A lot of times the weather has kind of beaten the cover down. And so at that time, it's really important to look for different types of cover. So whether it's hedgerows or cattail um, marshes, and places that have a really thick vegetative structure, this is an important uh, consideration to make. Another key aspect of pheasant's life is that when the weather gets cold, they seek out what's called thermal cover. And so particularly if you have conifer trees, whether they're pine trees or spruce trees, anything that provides a good break against the wind and real cold weather is going to be a place that pheasants might hide out. So it's important to think about it at the different parts of the season where pheasants might tend to concentrate and where they're going to hide out um, in order to protect themselves from the weather. When we look at what is important to consider as far as safe hunting, we need to think about how you line up. And so when you're hunting with a group and the limitation on uh, group hunting with pheasants is six hunters or less, it's really important that you have everybody lined up safely to allow the designated shooters to have ability to shoot straight ahead at birds flushing. And generally we would recommend not swinging through the line and turning to take a shot uh, behind the line because that's generally considered unsafe. So taking the shots at birds that are flushing within close proximity is really ideal from a hunter's safety standpoint. That's what we want to recommend. That's what we want to have everybody uh, literally shoot for and be able to achieve when you're afield. You want the birds to flush close and be able to get a good shot at a bird well within range. This uh, photo here illustrates exactly what we were just uh, talking about. So the two hunters in the middle carrying shotguns are parallel to each other in a line. The hunter or to their left is actually not carrying a shotgun. This is the person that's guiding them. So he's also in a, in a line with them. And then there's two people trailing behind. And these are observers. They're not um, shooting. They're not um, really participating very directly. They're simply observing and watching the hunt take place. And so in this manner, they're set up safely. 
if a bird were to get up behind the two hunters with shotguns and fly away behind the two observers, there would not really be a safe shot there because they would be shooting in the line or direction of the two observers. And for comparison's sake, if a bird got up to the right where the uh, gentleman is in the lower right and flew away, it wouldn't be a safe shot for the, the two hunters in the middle with the shotgun. So in this case, because you have two people with shotguns and three without, you have to be very thoughtful about how you're approaching the field and how you're going to need to limit your shots to essentially a zone of fire directly in front of you. One of the key aspects about pheasant hunting and all types of uh, small game hunting is that in order to be safe, you're required to wear blaze orange and blaze orange or fluorescent orange as some people call it is absolutely critical for safety because it allows you to be seen by other hunters or other outdoor observers from a distance and it also will allow you to um, be visible to your fellow hunters if you get into tall grass or tall vegetation where it limits your ability to see and so another way as you look at this uh, photo here you can really only see the tops of these two young hunters moving through the tall weeds Thankfully, they have that blaze orange hat on as required, so they're able to be seen well. And this is absolutely critical because when you get into those kind of places, if a pheasant gets up, you need to be able to see your fellow hunters and make sure you're taking a safe shot, not in the direction of another person. And the way that you can kind of supplement the visual communication uh, provided by blaze orange is to talk. So auditory communication is really critical. Keeping in contact with your hunting companions and even if there might be other people um, nearby, you always want to say something simple like hunter over here. Just making that declaration is going to make a lot of sense in order to limit the opportunity for an errant shot going in the direction of someone else. If you don't see them there, it wouldn't be uh, realistic to um, to even have that, that ability to know they're there. But you have to, have to, have to always be careful about what direction you're shooting. And so talk to your hunting group, talk to other hunters in the field and make sure that they're well aware of your presence. No matter what time of uh, season you go out, it's really important to make sure you're covering the field well. So hunters often zigzag back and forth in an attempt to kind of create confusion in the pheasant's mind and stop them from running. And this will often lead to the pheasant um, pausing and then getting nervous and flushing. And so in this uh, photo here, there's a nice uh, snowfall on a stocked pheasant field, and the hunters are working their way through cover. And so one key thing to remember is that if the pheasant gets up and fly, flies very low, that often that would be an unsafe shot, especially if you have a dog, as illustrated here. You need to be very mindful of taking low shots because there could be another hunter far in the distance ahead of you, and if you take a shot parallel to the ground at a flushing pheasant that's flying low, you may be um, errantly, you know, shooting in the direction of someone uh, far away in that kind of scenario. So it's always important to think uh, carefully about uh, what type of shot you're taking and make sure that every shot you take is one that you feel comfortable and safe taking. We want to make sure that you're prepared for the hunt as well as possible. And so we're going to give you some uh, tips talk about some tactics here, whether you're hunting with a dog or without a dog. These are just really important things to consider as you head a field and prepare for your hunt. The key tool for any pheasant hunt is gonna be the shotgun. So it is legal to use bow and arrow for pheasant hunting in our state and others, but to be realistic, almost everyone's gonna be toting a shotgun, and a shotgun is a tool that's going to fire a, a pattern of shot pellets, and those tiny shot pellets are going to spread through the air, and depending upon what type of choke you have installed in your shotgun, those are going to allow you to either have a tight pattern or a dense pattern or spread of pellets or a wider, more open pattern of pellets. But the main thing that's key to any shotgun utilization is to make sure you practice with it so you know it's effective range and so you're able to consistently hit targets out of the air. So what's illustrated in this photo here is a person launching clay targets or clay discs from a specialized launcher 
and then the person beside them with a shotgun getting ready to shoot. And so we highly recommend that anybody heading field for pheasants spends a good amount of time at the range. If you haven't got out there yet, there's still some time before the season or make sure whenever you choose to go pheasant hunting, you make sure you're going to practice enough with your shotgun. So clay target shooting is absolutely a critical way to prepare and provide realistic practice by shooting at these flying targets that can mimic the flight of a flushing pheasant. Our hunter safety classes really emphasize uh, knowing as much as possible about your firearm or bow. And if we were to look at shotguns, we would say, here's multiple types and there's everything from a break open action to a pump action to semi-auto to a double barrel. And if we were to look at maybe what might be most popular, uh, very common for a lot of uh, pheasant hunters, particularly ones that are newer, we might say it's the pump shotgun. And then a lot of more traditional, uh, very uh, experienced pheasant hunters often prefer a, a double barrel, whether it's an over under or side by side. But the key thing that we want everybody to think of is no matter what type of shotgun you're using, and they're all fine, uh, almost all fine for pheasant hunting, is to make sure. You understand how it works, make sure how to safely handle it, make sure to spend plenty of time practicing, and whether you're using a smaller gauge like this uh, illustration here, a side-by-side -side 410 for a youth hunter, or a larger gauge, the traditional 12 gauge is very common. No matter what you're using, make sure you practice with it and are very familiar with how it functions. The action of a double barrel shotgun allows it to be easily checked, so you can see that it's loaded. In this case, there's two shells that are able to be seen. And if you're using a pump action shotgun, you need to be able to understand how to properly load and unload it. As this hunter is doing here, we can see they're holding it on its side and they can cycle the action. It's often called a slide action or trombone style um, shotgun. That's going to allow you to make sure that you have only two shells um, in the tube and one in the chamber. So we will mention it later, but it's good to mention it right now. You're limited to only three shells loaded in your shotgun. So if you're using a pump action or a semi-auto shotgun, that's the maximum there. You'll have to have a plug in the shotgun to limit it to three shells. And of course, if you're using a, a, a double barrel shotgun, naturally that's only two shots. This illustration here provides a really good idea of what it's gonna be like using different chokes. And choke is simply a tube at the end of the shotgun. It's either a removable tube with screws or threads that allows it to be put in and out of the end of the barrel, or a uh, fixed choke is very common in shotguns as well, where it's just simply part of the, uh, the barrel and you can't actually change or adjust the choke. So going from the most open or kind of wide spreading choke at the top is the cylinder, and then you have improved cylinder, modified, and finally full choke. And by taking a look at this, you can see that if you were to use a full choke, at 40 yards, your spread of pellets on average might be about 40 inches. Whereas if you were to use a very open choke like cylinder, meaning essentially no choke, that 40 inch spread would be reached at only 25 yards. So that's a 15 yard difference between a cylinder choke and a full choke. And this is really critical because if you're getting a lot of shots at pheasants that are very distant, then maybe you'd want to use a tighter choke, meaning something like modified or full. But to be very uh, straightforward, the reality is most pheasant hunters are going to use either the improved cylinder or the modified because they provide really the best all around option and opportunity because the reality is you don't know if you're going to get some shots that are really close, so maybe 15 or 20 yards, or occasionally 30 yards or a little beyond. And so improved cylinder or modified is generally the type of choke that we would recommend. Just as important as choosing your shotgun type is in, in choosing the right shells. And you need to, of course, match the gauge type, whether it's a 12 gauge, a 20 gauge, a 16 gauge, or uh, the 28 or the 410, which are, are much uh, smaller. Whatever you're using, you need to make sure you pick the right shells and Size four, sorry, size five and six shot is most commonly used for pheasants. Size four is the largest legal size shot that you're allowed for pheasant hunting. So 
Um, some people are familiar with large shot pellets for, say, duck hunting or goose hunting. They might be using BBs. Well, that's not a legal size for pheasants. So essentially, you're using the smaller shot sizes, anything from size four all the way up to the fives, the six, and seven and a half. Some hunters would use a seven and a half, which is a standard load for um, target shooting, for breaking play targets. And that can be sometimes a little bit on the light side, meaning it doesn't have enough density and not enough um, kinetic energy or killing power for the pheasant. So that's why most people tend to stick with uh, size five and six shot and traditional lead shot. And then, of course, people do use um, non-toxic shot. There are a lot of great options available. So just make sure whatever you choose that you practice with it, you pattern it on what we call a patterning board, either a piece of wood uh, or a piece of cardboard in the appropriate location. Uh, find yourself a local sportsman's club or a local uh, Pennsylvania Game Commission shooting range that allows this type of uh, patterning to take place and make sure that you practice, practice, practice before you head a field and take a shot at a pheasant. Before organized uh, hunts for pheasants, a lot of people make sure to review some basic uh, firearms carries. And in this illustration here, Game Commission staff are preparing hunters before a mentored pheasant hunt. And this shows some safe methods of carrying your firearm. And this is absolutely critical when you're hunting with groups of people. So if you are hunting in a line and you're carrying your shotgun at what we would call um, a cradle carry, kind of in the crook of your arm, pointed skyward, that's going to be much, much better than that shoulder carry, which is very dangerous, where it's over your shoulder, and if someone catches your attention, you spin around, the next thing you know, the barrel of your shotgun or the muzzle of your shotgun is pointing right at them. So we really want to emphasize that you practice safe methods of carrying your firearm afield and make sure that you always keep the muzzle pointed in a safe direction. There's a lot of excitement when the pheasant gets up in the air. We've just talked about shotguns, we've talked about shot shells, and we just showed you, you know, some proper methods for carrying your shotgun. When that pheasant flushes in front of you, a lot happens quickly in your mind, and it's always important to not allow the adrenaline to take over and take an unsafe shot. So we all kind of get thrilled by the uh, the rush of the flush, as we might call it. And that flushing pheasant is rocketing out of there at pretty high speed. And so we want to just make sure that when you're heading to field this fall, that you keep safety in mind, first of all, and don't get kind of overwhelmed by the uh, excitement of the moment, but just kind of concentrate as best as you can and take a good safe shot when you're ready and make sure that that bird um, is kind of taken as quickly as possible with an ethical shot and harvested in range and able to be retrieved readily. We mentioned earlier a little bit about pheasant habitat, and we want to just reiterate this, that the earlier part of the season, uh, right now in October and in November, pheasants are going to spend a lot of time around the agricultural fields, weedy meadows, and long hedgerows. Once it shifts to later season and gets colder and there's less cover available, the pheasants are really going to seek a lot thicker cover, and they do this for two reasons keeping warm and evading predators that are a lot more efficient once the cover decreases. So once again, looking at places like thickets of brambles and shrubs, any kind of dense vegetative cover, cattail marshes, just the thickest, gnarliest habitat possible is often where these pheasants are going to hide out. And they're survivalists. They're going to do their best to uh, to make a go of it and, and live out there in tough conditions. And so Thinking carefully about where they're going to be hiding is absolutely critical. Pheasant behavior is a really important thing to keep in mind, that they're naturally going to seek places of thick vegetation to hide out. They're going to sometimes travel in small groups uh, to help them spot predators and discover new food sources. And once again, when they're pursued by a hunter, whether it's a two-legged human hunter or a four-legged predator like a fox or a coyote, they're going to prefer to run and hide before Flying. So flushing and flying away is a pheasant's last resort, and really what you're hoping to do is encourage them to fly and give you an opportunity to shoot them out of the air while they're flying away. So if you choose to pheasant hunt without a dog, what we recommend is to walk really slowly through the cover, zigzagging, meaning going back and forth, a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left, 
and try to make the pheasants uneasy so they're not comfortable with that type of movement. And it's a very predatory type of movement. If you think about how a fox or coyote would move through a field, they would typically sneak along a little bit and then pause and look and listen and sneak a little bit and they look and listen and smell. And so essentially you're trying to imitate the movements of a predator that would make the pheasant nervous enough to fly. Because without a dog, you're gonna be the one essentially creating enough uh, nervousness in the pheasant's mind to make it flush. And so if you have a group of hunters, you can spread out every 20, 30 yards and then walk carefully through the cover and just pay close attention to places where those pheasants might be hiding. Could be brush piles, any kind of uh, denser cover, like a, a thicket of blackberries or other brambles, just places where if you imagine yourself as a pheasant, you would want to hide to get away from a predator. Those are the types of places to check out and uh, we call it kicking cover. If you're hunting without a dog, you can go over there and just use your boots and kind of rustle the cover and see if a pheasant might jump out because you never know where they're going to be hiding, but it's going to often be in thicker places. Now, if you're pheasant hunting with a dog, this is a really unique way to experience upland hunting. The dog's nose is going to help you find game and they're going to be able to detect pheasants and flush pheasants in a much more efficient manner than you as a human hunter ever could. So by hunting into the wind, you're going to uh, see which direction the wind is coming from and generally try to hunt into it so that the pheasant scent is kind of blown into the nostrils of the dog and allowing it to then track towards the hiding pheasant or running pheasant. And so it's important to work uh, with a group of hunters and make sure that each person kind of knows their role as they work with the dog. And this is going to be a very efficient way to put up pheasants and encourage them to flush. So there's two primary types of bird dogs, uh, two categories, we could say, pointers and flushers. And so a pointer, as their name indicates, they stop and essentially are pointing their nose and pointing their head towards where the pheasant might be hiding. And they typically would range far afield and kind of go at a rather slow pace. And they're efficiently covering an area. They're going to quarter back and forth and cover a large area to try to detect pheasant scent. And then through training, they're taught to approach the spot where they smell the pheasant the strongest and then stop. And that allows the hunter with a shotgun to come up to that spot and then see if they can make the pheasant flush into the air and get a shot. Now, sometimes the uh, pheasant has actually just moved on from that spot and the dog has, has pointed and there's nothing still there, but they'll then take up the trail and pursue a little further. But this type of hunting is really exciting. There's a lot of uh, anticipation because you generally know the pheasant is there because the dog is pointing it and, and essentially telling you that here's the bird. And if you contrast that with a flusher, a flushing dog is just going to chase the pheasant until it flies and flushers are taught to work a little closer and they're generally quite fast. And so if you want some pure adrenaline rush and major excitement, follow behind a flusher. And so the dog that I hunt behind is a, is a lab, a Labrador retriever, and she's very fast and you need to really kind of have your running shoes on to keep up with her. Um, that's how I choose to hunt. And there's many different uh, types of dogs that are used for hunting. But if we break them into two categories, we would say the pointers and the flushers are the different types of uh, dogs that are used for pheasant hunting. And we're going to take a look at some others and talk about some uh, different breeds as we work our way through the presentation. So as you're hunting with the dog, this is really important. Make sure to give the dog space and allow its nose to work rather than kind of directing it where you think it should go and, and dominating the dog. You need to let the dog do its work, trust its nose, and allow it to uh, use its natural training and instinct to find pheasants for you. As you're working with your dog, it's really important to take frequent breaks to allow it to rest and give it a chance to get a drink of water. You'll see most uh, people afield with their dogs have multiple bottles of water. They rarely uh, take a drink themselves. The water's off for their dog. And so it's really critical to make sure your dog keeps hydrated because for every step that you take, they probably take 
10 or more steps and they're doing it at a fast pace. And so a lot of pheasant dogs at the end of the hunt are going to be quite exhausted. And if you cover two miles, they might easily cover 10. And so really critical to think about their uh, health and safety out there. And if you're hunting with a dog, be very aware of where other hunting groups are and make sure that if you get closer to them, that you're not interfering with them and your dog could be getting you know, into their their zone of hunt. And so make sure you're really cautious with um, approaching other hunting groups when you have a dog afield and that if they have a dog as well, that they're being respectful and practicing proper etiquette. Um, other hunters with dogs typically don't love it when the dogs approach each other from different directions and, and kind of get into a, a tussle and bark at each other. That's just really not, not ideal. So if you're working with a dog in a group and you see another group coming towards you and they have a dog, it's kind of best to uh, to steer clear and, and talk to the other group and see if you can avoid um, kind of stepping on each other's toes and choose another spot or turn around uh, to, to cover with your dog and avoid uh, running into others with dogs. A lot of different types of specific breeds for pheasant hunting, everything from uh, sh German short-haired pointers to uh, Griffon pointers to, as we said, Labrador retrievers are often used, uh, which are fl typically flushers, but sometimes labs are taught to point. So it all really depends upon how the human handler has trained the dog. And it takes a lot of time, hundreds, if not thousands of hours to get a dog really well trained to be an incredible pheasant uh, chaser and pursuer. So this is an absolutely amazing thing to watch a really good pheasant dog uh, field and to see them find the bird, to flush it, and then most importantly, to retrieve it. That's one of the best features of a dog with uh, pheasant hunting is that they can go find the bird when it is down by your shot and they can bring it back to you in their mouth. And that's one of the most uh, fun aspects of a pheasant hunt with a dog is watching that bird come back to hand. And so we all hope to uh, have you witness that um, sometime in your hunting career, whether you own a dog yourself or get to hunt with someone else who has a dog. In Pennsylvania, the limit for pheasants, the daily bag limit is two per day. And whether you go afield and, and bag your limit of pheasants each day, or you and your partner hunt hard for a few hours and only bag one pheasant, we really want to remind you that it's all about the experience and it's all about the adventure of, and the, the fun and thrill of uh, upland hunting. And it's not really possible or even realistic to bag a limit of pheasants every day you go out. But we really hope that you have a lot of fun and that you hunt safe and you hunt hard. And you enjoy every moment and really just try to bring back that uh, full bag of memories from your day of field. That's really what it's all about. And if you are lucky enough to get your limit of pheasants, that's wonderful. But don't sweat it if you don't, because even those of us that hunt, a lot and are really avid pheasant hunters. There's plenty of days that the pheasants uh, kind of beat us and we come afield with nothing but some empty shells and a lot of memories from our time afield. In Pennsylvania, we, as you said earlier, we have a lot of wonderful places to hunt pheasants and a lot of people do focus on harvesting the, the male pheasant, the roosters. So sometimes you choose to get a nice uh, pheasant you harvest mounted, you might take it to a taxidermist to get mounted, and that's a wonderful thing. They are beautiful birds. It's really fun to have them displayed. These two young men here have some nice pheasants that they chose to get mounted, but even if you um, don't choose to mount it, sometimes people keep the feathers and they use them for decoration. They're wonderful uh, for decorative pieces indoors, and sometimes people also use their feathers for tying flies for fly fishing. So there's a lot of ways in which you can use the feathers of a pheasant and they don't have to be uh, wasted or thrown away after they're harvested. As we mentioned earlier, there's all different types of dogs utilized for pheasant hunting. They don't have to be thought of as a traditional uh, pheasant hunting dog. And so beagles, which are typically used or most commonly used for rabbit hunting, also can be uh, pretty versatile as a pheasant hunter. And so this beagle here is, is one owned by Steve Smith, and he and his, his sons, go afield with the beagle, and that beagle is able to track down those pheasants and help get them flushed, and it's just a really uh, phenomenal uh, dog for pursuing pheasants, and 
they may not move as fast as some other dogs, but they're probably much more thorough than other dogs in terms of finding the pheasant scent and just being really uh, determined and tracking that pheasant down. And so we want you to think that um, no matter what kind of dog you have, you could potentially turn it into pheasant dog, but it's really critical to give it the proper type of training. Uh, wouldn't it be good to take your dog and sit on the couch right now and never been pheasant hunting? We don't want you to take it afield in two weeks and think it'll be able to flush pheasants and do fine. But if you think you might have a potential pheasant dog that actually hasn't been formally trained yet, we encourage you to connect with uh, one of the uh, training groups that are found across the state and the region. There's a lot of great resources about uh, how to link up with um, hunting dog groups. And so it is possible. There's been many examples. It is possible to take a, a non-hunting dog and turn it into a hunter. And probably one of the most critical things to do is make sure that your dog is not gun shy. And many dogs will be afraid of the sound of gunshots. And that's going to be something you'll have to kind of work through and navigate uh, before you try to convert a couch dog into a field hunting dog. Now, you might be asking yourself, what's needed for pheasant hunting? Maybe you've been before, maybe you know all this, but if you're newer and thinking about getting out of pheasant hunting, we want to make sure that you understand what is critical, what's absolutely required. So first off, you need your general hunting license. And so for adults, uh, this would be $20.97. For youth hunters, uh, 16 under, $6.97. A pheasant permit is required, and so that pheasant permit for adults helps to cover the cost of raising the pheasants and stocking the pheasants. And this is really a phenomenal value because if you go to a pheasant hunting preserve in Pennsylvania, they typically charge you $25 to $30 per pheasant uh, to be put out in the field, and then there's no guarantee you even harvest them. So a lot of people will go and spend two or three hundred dollars for a day of pheasant hunting at preserve. Well, you can have a whole season of pheasant hunting for just about $27, uh, which is a great value uh, provided by the pheasant permit. Blaze orange clothing, we mentioned earlier, is required. You must have at least 250 square inches combined on the uh, head, back, and chest. You have to have some type of vest that you can carry the birds in. So some specialized vests have a game bag on the back that allows you to put the harvested pheasants in. And that's a really key thing to help make it easier to carry the pheasants out of the field. We really recommend that you have some type of sturdy pants on, so not thin pants that could be penetrated by uh, briars or brambles. These are typically called brush pants, and we'll take a look at some examples of those. And we highly recommend that you have appropriate boots for walking through thick cover. Most people will use a very sturdy hiking boot or a, a tall leather boot, or sometimes if it's wetter cover, sometimes people wear um, thick rubber boots, but sneakers are not recommended. We really advise you to avoid sneakers because your feet are going to need to be well supported and able to keep up with a, a rigorous uh, hike a field through thick cover. These hunters here show you two examples of vests. The, the vest on the left on the young man is a, a full vest with a big game bag on the back, and that's a place you can put your, your limited two pheasants and have room for snacks and water bottle as well. The gentleman on the right is wearing what we may call more modern uh, strap type vest. It has side pouches that he probably is going to put some uh, water and, and other training tools for his dog. And there's a little bit of space in the vest for birds as well, but it's a, a much more light vest and often pretty ideal for warmer weather. These uh, hunters here give us a good illustration of what brush pants are. So they Typically, our pants that just have an extra layer of facing on the, uh, the thigh and the calf area, and that allows you to be better protected when you're going through heavy cover that could potentially cut you. This gentleman's wearing uh, chaps, which go over regular pants. So these really sturdy uh, chaps are going to protect his legs when he goes in a thick cover with his dog. So that's another option you could use uh, to wear chaps and protect you in the uplands as you hunt pheasants. So here's the rules for pheasant hunting. Rules and regulations are really uh, critical to follow uh, because they pertain, pertain to safety and making sure everybody has a fair opportunity. So as we mentioned earlier, the junior pheasant hunt season gets underway this Saturday. It runs Saturday, October 9th to Saturday, October 16th. Uh, no hunting on the Sunday date. Legal hunting hours are a half hour before sunrise to a half hour after sunset. 
the regular pheasant season for all ages starts on Saturday, October 23rd, runs through the 26th of November, and Sundays are excluded except for two dates. Those are going to be the first ever Sundays for uh, legal pheasant hunting in Pennsylvania, Sunday, November 14th, and Sunday, November 21st. And then the season is going to run uh, again from December 13th to 27th, and then start 13th to 24th, and December 27th to February 28th. Sunday is excluded. If you're hunting pheasants in a group of hunters, you must have six or fewer hunters, and that's the um, number that's limited for all types of small game hunting, six or fewer. And really critically here, if you are ever encountering a game commissioned vehicle that is stocking pheasants, it's unlawful to discharge a firearm within 150 yards of that vehicle. It's also unlawful to shoot into a safety zone which is the 150 yard buffer around occupied buildings like a home or a barn. Just to review, we've talked a lot about this in the earlier parts of the presentation. When you're trying to flush pheasants, it helps to hunt to the edges of cover. If you've been hunting a field, make sure you work your way all to the edges. The pheasants are often gonna move from the middle of the field once you spook them there, and they're gonna work their way to the edge, whether the edge is an open area like a harvested field or an edge of woods, that's often where the pheasants are going to end up hiding because you've kind of pushed them there. It's important to stop and pause, and every time you stop, that might make the pheasants nervous and put them into flight. Zigzagging back and forth helps to create uh, fear on the pheasant's part and make them more likely to flush. It's a great idea to slow the pace. Don't go too quickly because the faster you go, the more likely you are to kind of pass by pheasants and not make them nervous enough to uh, to get into flight. And then finally, prepare for runners. Pheasants really love to run. They don't want to fly much. And so just be aware that a lot of times, the moment you enter the field, pheasants hear or see you and they're already running. And so there's different ways in which you can uh, kind of work with this. But the reality is just know that often those pheasants are running and they're not able to be you know, caught up to right away until you get to the end of the field. And that's often where they're gonna stop, on the edge of the field, and that's when you're gonna get them to flush and get a shot. Here's the pheasant stocking map. We're gonna make sure this is shared with you in a, in a live link as well. But pheasants are stocked all across Pennsylvania, more than 200 locations, not only on state game lands, but some state parks and some county lands as well, as long as they're all open to public hunting. They are stocked throughout the season and stocking starting in October and November and into December. And these locations offer fantastic pheasant hunting uh, throughout the season, not just the beginning. So if you don't get out the beginning of the season, don't, don't worry. There's plenty of good uh, hunting to be had later on in the season. The pheasant stocking chart gives you an idea of how many birds are put out in each region on average. And so if you tallied up by the end of the season, there'll be over 220,000 pheasants typically uh, stocked, and it varies a little bit by region, but in general, the uh, pheasants are kind of spread out throughout the state in almost every county and in many, many spots um, in each county are providing high quality pheasant hunting opportunity. If and when you're fortunate enough to uh, harvest a pheasant, we advise you to follow these basic guidelines. So. Wear protective gloves, uh, rubber gloves, plastic, latex, whatever you choose. Make sure you wear them to protect your fingers. And we, we recommend you use sharp kitchen shears and you can cut through the wings, the neck and the body and remove them. Use a sharp knife to cut through the thin skin on the chest and expose the breast meat. Continue to remove the skin, pull it around the remainder of the body and then make a hole in the skin at the base of the breastbone and use that to remove the entrails, which are the intestines. So. This uh, photo illustrates it, or sorry, these, um, these paintings illustrate pretty well what it looks like. And we're going to send you a video. This video is going to show uh, a good demonstration of how to clean uh, pheasants, both the male and female. And they are, of course, um, the same on the inside. They just look a little different on the outside. But we want you to have a good idea of how we recommend approaching field dressing your pheasant and making sure it's prepared well for the table. So this illustration shows you some of the, the common areas to cut uh, uh, that are numbered. And then eventually, when you've properly cleaned a pheasant, it's going to look pretty much like a smaller version of your grocery store chicken. So 
they are in that chicken family and they're going to be a very uh, delicious, flavorful meat. And we really encourage you to cook it up and make a really wonderful meal out of the pheasants you harvest. So if it's warm weather, we encourage you to field dress the carcass right away to prevent spoilage of meat. Make sure it's cooked at least 160 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you store it in a freezer, be sure to double wrap it to prevent damage to the quality of the meat. Before you head a field, we really encourage you to make sure you know where you're going, know exactly what the stocking locations are, make sure you have the right equipment, you practice with it, have a hunting strategy, how you're going to approach the field, uh, what, what method you're going to use to uh, try to flush the pheasants, and always make sure to bring a positive attitude and be ready for outdoor adventure. So it's going to be a different each time you get a field. You can't always guarantee you'll see or find a lot of pheasants, but bottom line is just be positive and try hard and you're guaranteed to have a good time. It's important to keep in mind pheasant hunting etiquette. I simply provided uh, four basic recommendations here. Don't shoot at birds if someone else is flushed. So if there's another group nearby and they flush a bird, they should be the ones shooting at it and you shouldn't be shooting at a pheasant that's uh, coming from their direction. When you enter a field that other hunters are working, try to give them some space and maybe wait uh, till they're done or find another spot. Do your best to be patient and cooperate with other hunters and always be thinking of where your shot will travel. So it's a, it's a given that uh, pheasants are going to attract a, a good number of other hunters. It may be in a large field complex or a rather small field area, and you need to always think about where your shot is headed when you pull that trigger. We've got a list of recommended resources. We're going to give these uh, to you in a link. You can uh, click on them and Take yourself to these sites. It includes the pheasant stocking map, and we highly encourage you to check that out. It's going to tell you where these birds are going to be available in coming weeks. And we want to just thank you all for joining us. We're going to get ready for the questions now. We want to thank you for your time and listening. We appreciate the questions that are coming in. And Steve and Seth and I are going to do our best to answer your questions now and provide you with as much feedback as we can. Great. Thank you, Derek. That was fantastic. So we do have a few questions already coming in for those of you uh, that need to know how to submit the question. Uh, in the go to panel on the right of your screen, you should see a tab that says questions and you can just type your question there and we will see it on this end. If we don't get to everybody's question, don't panic. We are going to send an email with a summary of questions and answers to everybody that registered for today's event. All right, so we have some coming in. Let's see. We have some questions about the kind of um, arms that you would want to use. Uh, we have a question about using a bow. Is a 410 a good shotgun to use? All right, yeah, those are those are excellent questions. Um, Steve, do you want to share a little bit about the recommendations you'd make as far as the, the size shotgun and gauge? Sure. Th thanks, Derek. Uh, and that is a great question. As far as uh, shotguns for gauges, uh, my recommendation would be uh, what we'd be looking at is nothing under a 20 gauge. Um, th these are birds that have a lot of feathers, a lot of protection. They have the potential for it to be flushing far away. And just a 410, uh, in my mind, creates uh, too much risk of of wounding a pheasant and not actually safely and quickly uh, dispatching the animal and killing it. So I I would not personally go under a 410 or under a 20 gauge. I apologize. I'd stay uh, around a 20 gauge as a minimum, um, and then certainly from there a 16 gauge or 12 gauge uh, with probably the 12 gauge being the most preferred. Uh, I've even had instances with the 20 gauge where it was borderline um, too light of a, of a gauge for pheasants. So uh, again, 20 gauge would be as low as I would go. And uh, probably if had, you know, had my pick of any type of shotgun, I'd probably uh, prefer a, a 12 gauge for pheasants. Certainly in that as the season go on, goes on and there's a chance for longer and longer shots. Uh, but in, for me, uh, a 410 would just be too light of a gauge uh, for, for hunting pheasants. And I saw there was a question in there uh, about bows. A bow is uh, a lawful lawful in instrument uh, for hunting pheasants in Pennsylvania. Um, I know one individual who has done it, um, but it's certainly 
you could probably count the number of individuals in two hands who, who have done so in Pennsylvania, given how hard it is to hit a pheasant, even with a uh, with a with a shotgun, um, a single projectile like a bow. Uh, would be extremely difficult and certainly um, certainly wouldn't w recommend it being safe uh, to try any shot when the pheasant is flushed. That, that would be completely off limits with a bow and arrow. So uh, while technically illegal, I think it's a pre pretty limited use. So thanks for that question, though. All right, we have a question about what kind of licenses are necessary to hunt pheasants. All right, Seth? Sure, I can jump in there. As um, if you missed it in the presentation, the general adult hunting license for an adult is required. Plus, you also need the mandatory pheasant hunting permit, um, which is around roughly $26 for an adult. For a junior, uh, I would recommend a junior um, combo combination license, and you also need the free uh, junior hunting pheasant permit as well to hunt pheasants in Pennsylvania. Seth, is it different um, for military or disabled veterans? They would both need the same thing. Uh, military gets a reduced fee license um, from the start. So their, their general hunting license is just difference in costs. Great, thank you. We have some questions about um, stocking. Oh, let's see. One is about the Christmas stock and then um, ha having difficulty finding birds shortly after that stocking. I could touch base on that if you want. Yeah. Uh, stock stocking um, in Pennsylvania is spread out for a long period of time. And I can tell you the amount of birds that Pennsylvania produces and the quality of birds is, is very good. So we changed once the pheasant hunting permit became mandatory um, a few years back, we changed our stocking to stocking mainly on state game lands and other large public access properties rather than little, little um, farms around the area. So once our stocking changed, we changed the way and the amount of pheasants we're putting out. Um, and it comes to that Christmas season, where now you're into the late season and there isn't as many pheasants being put out as there was say in the earlier season because participation um, isn't as high and we don't have that many birds available to put out at that time. So birds are put out, but not at the same um, amount and rate that are put out earlier in the season. We rely that some of the birds have made it through the length of the season through the cover and are still there and we're putting out just slightly fewer birds, but ultimately we believe birds are still available to hunt during that season. But again, they change, like Derek said, they kind of change, you know, where they're looking and where they're going based off the weather conditions that are there and what they're looking to find food. Excellent. All right, let's see, how about, um, they're gonna get a link to the stocking schedule in the summary. I see some some other folks asking about that. You'll get an email that has a link to the stocking schedule um, throughout the state. Uh, let's see, how about some questions about dogs? How do I keep my dog safe? Is it required that the dog uh, wear orange? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that question. That's a really good one. So, you know, keeping your dog safe, that's kind of a, a two part there. So first of all, safe from the conditions in the field. And it's not required that a dog wear a vest. Um, some hunters will put a specialized vest on their dog to protect it from getting beat up by uh, the heavy cover, particularly if there's thorns in the area. So that is highly recommended in a lot of uh, locations. There will be uh, really, really thick cover that can literally make a dog bleed um, if it's charging through it at high speed. And so that's something that you will see hunters using as a way to protect their dog and keep it safe. And then secondarily, uh, a blaze orange vest on a dog keeps it safe from accidentally being you know, mistaken for another game animal like a deer or just basically the element of surprise when a dog's working through cover, it can't be seen well. And if your dog gets ahead of you and works towards another group, it might take them by surprise. So a lot of hunters use 
use a, um, a vest on their dog uh, to alert other groups in the area to their dog hunting. At the very least, they might have a, a blaze orange collar on the dog or some type of device that's going to help others see it. But if you're simply talking about how to keep your dog safe and particularly uh, keep it from getting you know, accidentally shot, which is not something that would <laughs> would likely happen ever, but it is a great idea to do something with your dog to make it stand out a little bit better. So we highly recommend you put um, a, a bright orange collar on it at the very least. And the other thing uh, for safety that a lot of hunters do is to put a bell on their dog. So there's different types of bells, but a bell helps you to track the, the dog when it's in uh, thick grasses and you can't really even see it. The, the bell helps you track it by sound. Of course, many hunters now are using uh, special collars on their dogs that are often called beeper collars, and that allows them to keep track of their dog. And sometimes that beep is a good signal to other people in the area that a dog is working the cover and to kind of pay attention. And so there's a lot of uh, important things to consider you know, about keeping your dog safe. And as mentioned earlier, we really recommend you give your dog plenty of breaks while at field. Make sure you have a lot of water to give it and to make sure to check it occasionally, make sure it's not bleeding, especially on their nose and their tongue. Very frequently, they, they, they lacerate their nose or tongue and it'll bleed a lot. Fortunately, they typically uh, recover from that quickly and they can keep hunting, but make sure you have a towel along to kind of help clean them up. But that's a great question. We really encourage you to make sure to keep your dog safe because that dog's uh, hunting for you and they're gonna make your hunting experience a lot better. There, Thanks for the question. Is if I could add some experience from, from my end as a, as a game yeah. warden, I would say one of the most important thing to keep in your dog safe as well as um, yourself is, is shot selection in itself. Uh, oftentimes I've seen where dogs will run and jump up after a, head, a pheasant that is flushed. Um, you just want to make sure that the, that the animal, the target you're shooting at is clear and you have a safe shot before you pull that trigger and that you were shooting in the right direction and, and you should have no issues. And oftentimes inexperienced hunters, as Derek mentioned, pheasants don't normally like to fly, they like to run on the ground. Um, so poor shot selection could lead to a possible um, uh, mistake happening, but we don't like to see that. So it, it falls on the hunter to make sure you have a safe shot and, and really um, think before you shoot. All right. Um, what about training dogs? I think, Derek, you had mentioned that there are some groups across the state that hold events or that can um, help you train your dog. How do I connect with those groups? Sure, that's an excellent question. I will, uh, that's something that we'll make sure to include in the uh, follow-up uh, email to list some of these great websites that uh, tell you all about how to connect with these groups. So, whether it's a small group of people that specifically train pointers or flushers, or there's an organization called the North American Versatile Hunting Dog Association, NAVDA, there's a lot of really avid trainers of hunting dogs and sporting dogs. And sometimes the dogs don't even actually hunt. They just do what they call field trials and they just test them out and uh, compare them to each other in competition. So I will send you a link to some really excellent resources uh, that, tell you all about how to connect with clubs in your areas. Sometimes you can just go and watch and learn from these trainers, whether you have a dog already or not, and they'll kind of clue you in on what needs to be done to give your dog some training because it is very intimidating. It's a very challenging process to train a dog well, to be a very efficient upland hunter. Pheasant hunting is challenging. The birds are, are bigger and can be kind of tough to even retrieve sometimes for dogs. So there's a lot of things to consider, and I'll send you a, a list of what we recommend as far as resources to connect with uh, groups that are specializing in hunting dogs. Hey, Lori, if I could jump in real quick. I know we have a lot of uh, really good questions coming through, and one I wanted to uh, get to and ask uh, Seth to weigh in here before uh, before it gets lost is um, we have a question about taking a mentored youth out pheasant hunting. And if, yeah. if I recall correctly, our board uh, changed the regulations recently so that mentored youth can participate in pheasant hunting. However, there is still the requirement that the adult 
uh, be the one carrying the firearm while in the field. So, Seth, if, if you could talk to that and uh, what they can do to make sure uh, that they're legal and yet that the mentored youth is still able to potentially get uh, a shot at a pheasant or two this fall. Yes, that mentored youth program is a great program that allows um, the mentors to take a, a mentored youth under the age of 12 hunting. Now, this mentored youth would need the mentored youth hunting permit, and the person taking them would have to be a properly licensed hunter over 21 years of age, and they would need to have a pheasant permit as well taking them. Now, there can only be one firearm between the two of them. Um, when they're walking, anytime they're moving, the mentor themselves has to carry the firearm. Um, so you're probably wondering how do I how do I get a safe shot at a pheasant if uh, for the mentor? But it's still possible, especially with your hunting with a pointing dog would be a good example of when you're doing that. Um, get to a spot where the dog is is holding tight on a bird and pointing on a bird. Then you can transfer the gun uh, to the mentor himself and prepare him for the shot. Now I wouldn't recommend doing this for the first thing they ever hunt you know practicing with some clay targets uh you know because you are shooting at a moving target so you know it's hard enough for adults like myself i don't have the greatest uh, luck at hitting them all that often but you know practicing makes them better and you get out with a kid and that's just one way that you could possibly have some luck taking them pheasant hunting. All right. Um, let's see. We have another question here about youth hunting. Are, are there opportunities for youth specifically um, for like uh, lessons or training events for pheasant, youth pheasant hunting? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we, the Pennsylvania Game Commission, offer specialized mentored hunts that introduce youth to pheasant hunting and they're called junior pheasant hunts and they are held uh, at the uh, start of the junior pheasant hunting season so this uh, saturday and the next saturday the 9th and 16th statewide there's about 30 of these uh, junior pheasant hunts taking place and so they require pre-registration and many of them include uh, training and preparation uh, before the hunt and so that opportunity for this season is um is already kind of booked and completed. However, we are going to share with you a variety of resources, um, articles that, that our agency staff have created that give you some good ideas about how to work with a youth hunter um, or even any new hunter. So whether it's a 12-year-old or somebody um, you know later on in adulthood, what, if they're a first-time hunter, they need to do the same type of practice. And so we'll share with you more resources uh, that, that give you ideas about how to, to get that new person started. But I think the bottom line, going back to what Seth said, is that you need to practice a lot with your shotgun and shooting clay targets before you're going to go out and shoot at a live bird that's flying quickly. And so that's a, an important thing is to make sure you can find a, a shooting range close to you and practice on clay targets uh, before you attempt to shoot a, a live pheasant. And that's going to really be, you know, the best overall way to prepare for your first pheasant hunt is to get a field in a, uh, a shooting range situation and shoot some clay targets, get some practice under your belt, and then uh, find the right kind of place to go into your first pheasant hunt. So we'd be happy to follow up with you and, and provide you more information about, you know, getting get a youth hunter started in particular. And as we said, the agency offers the special youth season, uh, that's one week season that starts before the regular season, and we encourage youth to hunt all throughout the, the regular season as well. It's a great way to get it out with friends and family and hunt in a very social and fun environment. And just a clarification, um, Seth, on the junior pheasant hunt, is the adult allowed to carry a firearm and shoot, or are they just accompanying the youth? This is the they junior hunt, company. not the mentored. Yeah. The junior season is, is for the juniors um, and the mentored youth. You know what I mean? The mentored youth can partic participate in any junior hunting season. So they can go out, they can carry that, but they cannot shoot. Um, the adults cannot shoot during the junior Thank season. you. Thank you. 
All right, let's see. Oh, here's a good one. If this is the first time I'm out pheasant hunting, where am I placing the shot on the bird? What am I aiming for? I love that question. <laughs> you really want to focus closely, if you can, on the bird's head. Now, your pattern of shot is going to be spread pretty wide. You know, if the bird's close, uh, within 10 yards or less, your pattern of shot in the air might only be the size of, say, a beach ball. It might be you know, 18, 20 inches, whatever. But if the bird's further out, as we saw on that choke tube uh, chart, it might be 40 inches or more. You know, it might be three or four feet wide. But you need to have something that you focus on. And what we really advise people to focus on is the head of the bird. So with a shotgun, as we know, you point it rather than aiming it. It's not aimed precisely like a rifle is. It's just pointed. Oftentimes, we use the analogy of it's like using a garden hose. And the way you would spray, if someone was running along on the lawn, you wanted to spray them with water, you'd have to move the hose along and kind of track them. And you're not trying to precisely hit them in a spot. You're just trying to, like, paint them with water, splash it on them. And so that's essentially what you're doing with a shotgun. But if you just look at the whole bird, the problem is a pheasant with its long tail is going to be two or more feet long. And it doesn't do you much good to hit them in the tail. It's not going to kill them. So you need to look hard and focus on the head of the pheasant. On a male, it's easy because there's that bright white ring neck collar. On a female, it's all brown. It's a little harder. But that's an excellent question because a lot of pheasants are missed because people don't really look intently at the bird. They just kind of see it, point in a general direction, and pull the trigger. And most often, people are shooting behind the bird. The bird's traveling fast. They miss behind it. They don't keep the shotgun moving, and they're not focusing enough on the head. And so... In order to be a consistent shotgunner, whether you're hit, trying to shoot pheasants or morning doves or ducks or geese, you have to focus on the head of the bird. And more specifically, a lot of people say, try to you know, keep your eyes locked on the beak of the bird. So that's just a really important thing to uh, consider as you're trying to hit the bird and make the best shot possible. So thanks for that question. I think you probably helped a lot of people by asking that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's, here's some more kind of in that line. Is there a preferred time of day to hunt pheasants? Steve, what would you say? Well, for me, it's uh, any time I can get out there. I, I've had uh, luck all hours of the day. Uh, for me, typically, I'm coming home after work, um, getting my sons after school, and we're heading out for the last hour or two. And We've had uh, plenty of luck then. I, I know this coming Saturday we'll be out uh, first thing with the uh, junior season starting at first light, and I expect we'll have luck then. So that's that's what's really nice about pheasant hunting, in my opinion, um, and you know, small game in general, be it squirrels as well, is it, there's not so much uh, the timing just during the specific uh, you know hours of the day, and if you miss that window, you know, you, you might as well be at home. That's uh, not really what pheasants is about that you can get them uh, you can find them any time of the day uh, wherever whatever your your schedule allows to get out there um, it, you, you still are running a chance of being successful no matter when it may be so uh, yeah it, they're uh, one of the benefits like i said is it provides you with that that ma that amount of flexibility that whenever you can get out there you still have a good chance what about weather like what if it's raining does the strategy for pheasant hunting change at that point my experience has been if, if it's raining, if it's a heavy rain, uh, they do not like to flush uh, as much. They will, will, they will sit tighter. And I say tighter because they sit tight as it is. So now, you know, they will even more so be reluctant to fly in the air. And, uh, you know, when, when that happens, it's, it's really about it keeping your eyes down right in front of you because the opportunity is that one is going to, uh, come up right at, at your feet. I've, I've had that happen many times in, in the rain, especially a heavy downpour. They are going to want to sit as tight and as close to the ground as possible and uh, will literally let you walk right by them or, you know, come within several inches before they'll finally flush. All right. We'll take a few more questions. I know we don't want to hold you guys up, and I'll remind everybody um, that we are going to send out a summary of all the answers, even to the questions we didn't get to tonight. Um, let's see. Uh, what if they're running along the ground? We heard you talk about that. Can I shoot them while they're running along the ground? This, 
this is a really good question because legally, sure, there's no uh, rule that says you can't shoot a pheasant on the ground ethically and safety-wise. We would never recommend shooting a pheasant on the ground because, first of all, you know, your shot might travel beyond uh, or definitely will travel beyond where that bird is. And there could be another person in the distance. There could be a, a dog. And so shooting at pheasants on the ground is really um, what we consider unsporting and uh, most importantly, not safe at all. And so even though it might be very tempting to do that and you might very well see a pheasant running ahead of you, it's just not worth the risk. There's a lot of things that could go wrong and we would just highly recommend you do everything to um, sort of catch up to that pheasant and pursue it and try to force it to fly and take a, a shot of the bird that's flying. And like Seth said, if it doesn't fly much into the air, if it stays really low, that's often not safe as well. So if it's just kind of skimming the tops of the grass and kind of level to the ground, we really recommend uh, just simply not taking a shot because there's a lot of... Um, opportunity for something to go wrong. There may be other hunters nearby or a dog that you can't see. And so the ideal shot is a pheasant that travels what we would say, or what we call above the horizon. So above your kind of line of sight. So rising above your head and going away, it might be, you know, going to the, the left or right or straight ahead, but we would highly recommend you take shots at birds that are not low, meaning below your level of sight and definitely not taking shots of birds on the ground. That's kind of one of the ethical dilemmas you see throughout hunting, um, whether it be pheasant on the ground, you see a turkey in a roost or ducks on the water, shooting ducks on the water, all of which are, are legal by the law, but don't portray hunting in the greatest image. And we are trying to um, promote hunting and, and promote it through that way. So ethically, it's viewed as being wrong. Legally, it's it's allowed, but like Derek said, it's um, something that should be avoided if you could. Thank you. And then I think we just have a little bit of confusion um, about the pre-registering for a junior pheasant hunt uh, event and the junior pheasant hunt season. So the oh. junior hunting season has no pre-registration, correct? That's correct. Yeah, the, for clarity purposes, the junior pheasant hunts are mentored hunts and they are events that you register for. And the deadline for registration is uh, the end of September. And so those events are closed. But the junior pheasant season is a uh, season lasting from October 9th to the 16th, and it's open to any junior hunter, so age 16 or under. And as Seth said, if they have a junior license or if they're men or youth uh, under the age of 12, that is wide open. All the places that are stocked for junior pheasant season are open to any youth hunter and their mentor. And so there's essentially uh, two things going on. The junior pheasant hunts are mentored hunts that are uh, coordinated by the Pennsylvania Game Commission, and they take place within the ongoing junior pheasant season. So thank you for that question. I hope that clears it up a little bit. And we, we do hope that you're able to get a field with uh, a youth hunter and make the most of the opportunity this season. Yeah, we, and also I'd, I'd encourage you to go out there. I, I know, Derek, you have a dog. I used to have a dog. Um, and a lot of people that have dogs, you know, adults that maybe don't have a junior to take, they sometimes go out and just go around the, the pheasant fields on those days when the season opens for the mentor, hoping to find a kid to take because they have a lot invested in their dog and like to watch their dog work. For, for a lot of people with dogs and pheasant hunting, that's what it's about. And so you can so oftentimes find people willing to, to mentor you a little bit when you get out there if you, if you go out to those fields and, and look around. I know Commissioner Layton was one that um, – did that a lot for youth in our area, would always take his dog out to the local pheasant fields and hope that uh, he could find a junior hunter to, to cow around with for the day and let his dog do the work. So we encourage you, we wanna see you out there, that's for sure. That's so great. All right, folks, we're gonna wrap things up so we can be respectful of your time. 
everyone who registered will get a, a summary of the questions with all the answers and a whole bunch of links to fabulous resources that we've talked about throughout the event tonight. Uh, you will get a separate email that has a link to the recording to this webinar that you heard tonight. Uh, want to thank De Derek and Seth and Steve for sharing their expertise and time with us tonight. And we'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. We hope that you're able to visit us again sometime and learn more about Pennsylvania wildlife in upcoming webinars. So with that, I will let our panelists say a quick goodbye and we will see you all later on your outdoor journey. Don't forget the Game Commission can help you learn to hunt. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Tonight. And thank you, Lori. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. You guys do all the good stuff. Best of luck thank this fall, all. everybody. Thank you. Have a fun, safe hunting season. Appreciate your time. Enjoy the pheasants.